Okay, uh, this is uh, Aaron Murakami, and today is Tuesday, September 30th, 2014, and uh, it's about uh, 11 o'clock here uh, Pacific. I'm up here in, out of uh, Spokane, Washington, and on the phone with me today, I have Stacy James Fry, who is heading up a Kickstarter campaign called Tesla Man of Light, and uh, there are several goals to this campaign. Um, Stacy, uh, would you mind just kind of uh, in, you know, telling a little bit about yourself and uh, kind of what the overall bullet point mission of the uh, campaign is about? Sure, yeah. Uh, first, I'll just say hi, everybody. Nice to digital meet you. <laughs> uh, my name is Stacy James Fry. I'm the president and CEO of a um, startup, well, kind of an intellectual property company operating out of Calgary, Canada, which ironically just happens to be oil country. I was born and raised here, um, went to high school here, and then I left. Uh, went across Canada, and then back ended up in Vancouver, and then ended up in a small town called Nelson, B.C., which is kind of an alternative hippie town. A lot of uh, draft dodgers from the 60s ended up there. Uh, I landed there when I was 21, spent a good portion of my life there, about eight years. And uh, it was during my time there that I came across... Um, things like what we're going to talk about. So this campaign that we're doing is designed to develop a major television drama for a major television network. Uh, I'll tell you how we plan on doing that. It's very realistic. And um, as part of that, also cultivate the market so that there's really no objection to, from a marketing standpoint or from a revenue standpoint uh, in within the business, to put this television series on television and invest the dollars necessary to do that. So the starting point is this Kickstarter campaign. Um, it's called Tesla Man of Light. So if you go to kickstarter.com and you search Tesla Man of Light, you'll see it come up. The first thing you see is it's a sci-fi TV series. Don't get upset by the sci-fi part. It's just part of how we Trojan horse this into the market. And we do a graphic novel and, and a series of games. It's all geared to um, expose the story of Nikola Tesla, which from my point of view is an under-investigated story, even from a literary point of view. Uh, from what I've read, I've got a couple of books that I've read, which of course doesn't tap the whole amount of stuff that's out there. I've read uh, the book Tesla, Inventor of the Electrical Age by W. Bernard Coulson. Uh, of course, read um, Tesla, Nikola Tesla, My Inventions and Other Writings, uh, through Penguin Classics. And then I've gone on to uh, teslacollection.com and read a lot of the articles that were written by Tesla or about Tesla during his lifetime and some of the things that he was saying and doing at that time. So that's the, the um, <clears throat> limit of my understanding of Tesla uh, from the literary point of view and what's available in the archives. Uh, mm -hmm. I've also um, <clears throat> been looking at and have read, actually the thing that got me really into this whole topic was uh, Gene Manning's book, uh, The Coming Energy Revolution, uh, which I picked up in Vancouver at uh, Banyan Books when I was, uh, well, I guess about 12, 13 years ago. <clears throat> yeah, I guess it was 14 years ago now. Something along those lines. So I uh, came across that book um and it really opened my mind. I mean, I was already an open-minded person, having lived, in, lived all that time in Nelson, exposed to people who said they had free energy devices, but I didn't really know anything about it, and I didn't see one in operation in front of me, so I can't claim that. Uh, however, um, it just was a, a time in my life when I was doing a lot of meditation, had a lot of success with that in respect to um, putting an end to compulsive thinking patterns, and when you do that, your mind just becomes an open vastness of space, a uh, peaceful, loving space. And from that point of view, we became aware of and open to all kinds of ideas, including unlimited abundance of the universe. And the obvious translation of that would be free energy, or as I like to think of it, open-ended fuel sources. And uh, wanting to pursue a film and television career as a writer and producer so I could get a lot of these ideas out there. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually established my company around a certain number of intellectual properties, and one of the first things I wanted to do was the story of Tesla. Ended up... Now, um, we don't, go ahead, Jim. 
Um, you, you have some pretty big names of uh, some people who are some serious mover and shakers in the film industry who you're working with. Uh, for example, uh, Fred Fuchs, who uh, produced Godfather Three and Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula. Um, yeah, how, how did you manage yeah. to um, hook up with him and, and get him involved in wanting to produce a Tesla TV series? Because that's, uh, that's some pretty serious uh, credibility there. Yeah, I'm obviously honored uh, to be working with him, not just because of his credentials, but because of who he is and what he's told me over the last couple of years that I've been working with him. Um, you know, here's a guy who was president of American Zoetrope for 12 years, and that's Francis Ford Coppola's company. They were in San Francisco, and of course, uh, George Lucas helped found that company, and there's been a lot of great films that came out of there. And uh, more than just those two credits, he has 15 credits uh, to his name out of that film company, including New York Stories, which I find to be a landmark film, even though very few people know about it. It was a film that was co-directed by Scorsese, Woody Allen, and Coppola, and it was his brainchild. And during that time, he wanted to do a Tesla movie, a feature film directed by Coppola or someone like him. Uh, Lucas was involved as well, according to Fred, although to what degree, I don't know exactly. He didn't extrapolate on that. Um, Fred plays his cards very close to his chest, and that's probably why his friendships last a very long time. Mm. So how I came to him uh, was pretty simple. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd been struggling through the years to, you know, get myself off the ground in this chosen field. I ended up having to go back to tree planting, which is one of the most god-awful, wonderful experiences one can have. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows about it, but we actually physically plant three, four, five thousand trees a day sometimes by hand, wow. repopulating the forest. So I've done quite a few years of that. I did eight total years of that. In the last two years I did it, I was not young anymore, and it was quite a challenge, and it really gave me the impetus to get the hell out of that kind of thing and really make something work. So I filmed the entire experience with the intention of putting it together as a uh, uh, reality show. So during the day I was filming and planting and during the night downloading things and then um, putting it in the archive. When I headed home, I got it edited together as a trailer. I submitted it part of a submission to uh, Bell Media, which is one of the, the major media conglomerates here in Canada, and they awarded me a fellowship, which um, took me to the Banff World Media Festival in 2012. Part of that fellowship, they give you access to all the individuals, particularly development executives who are there to develop content for television, and one of the names that jumped right out obviously it was Fred Fuchs. Now, I didn't actually know him or of him before seeing his name listed there, but I saw that he was uh, head of creative content at the Canadian National Broadcast Channel for quite a few years, and during his time there commissioned the Tudors, Borgias, Vikings, a few other very phenomenal uh, television series that uh, I was in love with. And I thought, wow, here's a great chance. And so I did a little more investigation, obviously found out he was at Zoetrope. I just couldn't believe my lucky stars. He took a meeting with me. It was my mm -hmm. first meeting of a three-day experience in Banff. And um, he said, uh, well, when I, when I communicated with him by email, I sent him about six different proposals in about a paragraph format. One of them was this idea of doing a television series about Nikola Tesla. So when I sat down with him for my 15, 20-minute meeting, which happens, you basically get 20 of those all for the three days, and uh, he said, well, I took this meeting because of this Tesla project you want to do, and he told me the history of how he had wanted to do it uh, with Coppola, it didn't get off the ground for various reasons, he wouldn't extrapolate why it didn't get off the ground, but he didn't indicate a conspiracy, he just indicated that scheduling problems and other sort of issues prevented it from getting finance and off the ground. Uh, but that Daniel Day-Lewis was going to star and that Coppola was going to direct and for whatever reason didn't get, didn't get off the ground. So he was excited to do this. A year later, uh, I asked him to be a part of this Kickstarter campaign. He said, sure, let's do it. And we recorded our portion of our video for that at the 2013 uh, event. And um, that's how he and I came to work together. Okay. Awesome. Now, if uh, everybody goes to Kickstarter 
com and search for Tesla Man of Light. When you go to that campaign page, uh, towards the top, there is an introductory video, what's maybe about 10 minutes or so, and that gives a yep. really good uh, overview of um, who's involved uh, behind the scenes and what their roles are. Um, so besides um, Fred Fuchs and, you, you know, on the uh, TV or, or the TV series production side of it, uh, there's also plans to create um, like a video game. Is this for like smart smartphone apps, Tesla games, or like desktop games, and and who's behind that? And uh, sure, how, how does that yeah, come in? Yeah, there's two other individuals involved that are sort of the main core team. There's one uh, Mike Sorrenti from a company in Toronto called GamePill.com, and they do a lot of um, contract work for Disney, Nickelodeon, Marvel few other uh, brands, quite a few other brands, and they develop mobile games, mostly adventure games, and they do PC games, which are interactive uh, computer games. And so we thought, well, actually Mike was one of the guys I met at that original um, Banff World Media Festival uh, event as well in 2012, and we became friends. And so we stayed in contact when I told him I was doing this. He got excited, said he'd love to do, you know, the mobile and PC portion of the IP. And I initially thought, well, I don't know if we can pull that off. And he started talking to me about, you know, how these interactive games work and how they would relate to Tesla technology. And he started to explain to me how we could do it from a story point of view. And it just really made a lot of sense because part of the whole objective of this project is to crack open or dislodge the inertia around these topics so that they can break through into the mainstream mind and really, at that point, be unpreventable from happening, no matter how much oppression there is, especially now with the energy crisis and a real demand. You get a hold of young minds and you expose them to things and even, even create games that allow them to interact and assemble devices in a 3D sort of environment. Then it just becomes obvious to them that these things work, whether or not they've been told that it can't exist or whatever. And right. so that's why it's really important for us, if we can, to reach those stretch goals where we can finance the building of those games and PC games so that we can spread these ideas through those markets as well. It just makes it more plausible from the grander point of view that, that we'll be able to not only win from a production point of view in our particular campaign, and not only a campaign, but the products we want to do, but that the underlying objective here being to push these things into the marketplace so that it's just undeniable. It becomes an undeniable force for change in this direction. And that's really the objective of the whole campaign from my point of view. Now, maybe that's altruistic. I don't know. So far, our campaign has attracted a lot of attention from Tesla files. But from my point of view, from a meditation point of view, all things are possible. All the universe is abundant in love. And here's an opportunity for us to make that happen. And I want to make it happen as much as I can in every fiber of my body. So that's where I'm coming from. All right. Well, Tesla should definitely be a household name, you know, especially with the younger generation. And uh, hopefully it's done in a context where uh, people are seeing, you know, the real Tesla and not just you know, the popularized stuff about high voltage coils and, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, that plays into it, but certainly there's a lot, you know, quite a bit more behind uh, his work. Yeah, I mean, there's quick, major, major you know. blank spot. I mean, even in the in the uh, sort of archive of people who have written about it or talked about it, I mean, mm-hmm. even the people from, you know, the Belgrade uh, Museum, um, you know, the Tesla people in New York, you know, I mean, there's just, a lot of blank spots. People don't know what the true story is. There needs to be a true investigation of all these mm-hmm. topics. I wanted to go to Croatia. I have friends there who uh, work with embassy films. I actually wanted embassy films to be a part of this campaign, but they work in a different way, and essentially what they are is a service production company. And they're right now shooting and have been shooting Game of Thrones for the past you know, four seasons. They're doing season five. They're in Croatia, which is the birthplace of, of Tesla. They're culturally interested, uh, but they still operate on a business level and couldn't get involved because they didn't know what the script was and they didn't know what you know whether or not we were going to get financing because they're a, they're a service production company. However, they're also behind this campaign in a major way in the sense that they want to see it happen mainly from a cultural point of view. And there's a lot of people on the ground who've never been talked to, 
you know, whether they're in Croatia, Serbia, or France, or even in Liverpool, where Tesla uh, sailed from to America, uh, a lot of people in New York, for sure, Philadelphia, you know, a lot of different places that probably have little bits of information that aren't out there in any kind of compiled format that would fill in a lot of gaps about Tesla. And I think that's going to be another reason to do this um, and to back this campaign because that's one of the objectives of our, our uh, development project, doing the story Bible itself, is to um, sort of bring new information uh, that's never been discussed or compiled into the fold so that we, as people who are interested in this, can expand, get the expansion of knowledge and understanding of Tesla and his life story. Mm-hmm. Now with um, another, another objective. Mm-hmm. Now you know with the uh, the TV series and the overall story, you know obviously there's going to be you know historical parts to Tesla's life and uh, some non-technical stuff. There's going to be you know uh, mm-hmm. technical pieces of history as far as you know the the tech, some of his technology itself and and all that. So basically as a package, who's going to be um, you know, behind actually writing the storyline and um, being able to check for the accuracy and and kind of, you know, develop it from, you know, A, a to Z. I mean, do you have, like, is there like a staff of writers? Or? Yeah, okay, well, what happens is there's, uh, that's a good question because a lot of people are asking what's the story and who's going to be in it, and that's definitely putting the cart before the horse. Um, in this case, the development dollars go into acquiring what is called a list writer. And that's somebody who has a reputation, who has a series built around them. In the past, they're experienced what's called showrunners, so they essentially take the vision and, and um, spearhead the whole writing group when they get to production, so that all the series, if there's multiple series, everybody's you know staying within the the, um, the confines of the reality of the research and the truth of the story, and. So that's partly what happens in this case. Now, there's a lot of different groups that we can go to, or individuals, sorry, we can go to who, uh, who have already probably written uh, Tesla stories or scripts, but they're not necessarily list writers. And in order to get a network involved, you have to have a list writer. That's somebody who's you know, well-known in the industry, trusted by the network. Now, this doesn't really? mean that they're trusted because they're going to just lay it down for whatever the network wants. Don't don't get that idea. The world is not as full of conspiracies as everybody thinks. It's just that they need to have that comfort level because they're investing millions, right? Mm-hmm. And not just a few million, but tens of millions. I mean, um, Fred and I have talked about the budget, potential budget for this series, and it's, it's hovering right between four and six million dollars per episode, with a projected ten to thirteen episodes per season. So, you know, the money starts racking up and there's a lot of anxiety around that. Networks need to feel confident and comfortable. So I can't necessarily be the person to write the story, even though I feel like I have a good handle on it. Uh, however, as the producer and the thread, we get to oversee and manage that process. Uh, so whatever writer we pick, uh, it's going to be somebody who, number one, is interested in Tesla, two, has a sort of a long history of, of being... Uh, successful in the marketplace from a, a serialized television series point of view. I mean, I can think of a few things. Uh, there's one writer in particular that Fred's worked with quite a bit, and he's uh, done the last four TV series that I really love, which are The Tudors, Borgias, Vikings, and Candela. He wrote all four. Uh, mm-hmm. And so we may get him, we may get someone else, but, you know, with Fred's reputation, we attract a lot of, of uh, very talented but also very successful people so that, you know, mm-hmm. every time we add these people, the probability of success just increases. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Now, you know, as far as, um, you know, there's uh, I have quite a few associates who are, uh, you know, pretty well known for their um, technical background and uh, uh, ability to actually replicate, you know, different uh, technologies relating to Tesla, but uh, one thing that helps to give them such a great understanding of what what they're doing is that they also happen to be historians um, and not just technical builders. And so if there's, um, you know, if you would like to actually, con- you know, talk to uh, some of these people uh, to get their take on uh, the Tesla history and, you know, any kind of uh, technical consulting on the 
technologies themselves, I'd be you know more than happy to uh, connect you with uh, anybody I know that might help you know push that along and uh, you know help give. Well, what we're looking know, for, you know, what we're looking for, and I reached out right. to you know people like Adam Trombley, and I did actually write a, a message to your um, your friend there um, online that we've been talking mm-hmm. about, who I didn't know about before. Let's say his name again. Yeah. The, oh, you're talking uh, about um, uh, Eric Dollard. Yeah, Eric Dollard. We were just looking at his uh, his cosmic induction generator and and things like that. So this is what I'm talking about. I mean, mm-hmm. The beauty of a TV series like this is a good portion of it is going to take place in Tesla's laboratories mm-hmm. uh, because that's where Tesla always is, right? <laughs> He's working there. I mean, when we construct a series, we've got to think of the sets, right? So we think of, mm-hmm. okay, Delmonico's, where he loved to go to... Um, you know, to eat in New York, and who's at Delmonico's? Well, everybody's at Delmonico's. Everybody you can imagine: Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, the Rothschilds, all these people who are, um, you know, more or less pointed at as those who undid or undermined Tesla. Well, guess where they all hung out together? Where they actually physically, in fact, interacted? Well, you've got Delmonico's. Then you, you know, mm-hmm. the, that whole side of that world can be explained in that setting. The rest of it is in Tesla's laboratories or on his mm-hmm. on his uh, project site. And as I was saying to you earlier, uh, one of the things Fred and Coppola did um, for Bram Stoker's Dracula is they decided that they were going to do nothing but in-camera effects for that film. So nothing. And that, that means no computer-generated effects. No con- computer-generated effects whatsoever in that right. film. It's all in-camera effects. It's actually physically being done on set somehow. Whether it looks the way it actually is or not is irrelevant. It's actually physically being done in some fashion or another. And I see that mm-hmm. being our approach to this particular series because this creates the opportunity through our production budget, our set design, and our, our art direction, and all the different production elements and costs that go into We can funnel a lot of that into creating an environment that is physically operational from a device point of view. And right. some of the effects that we were talking about can be demonstrated on camera and with all the PR around the idea that everything that we're doing on this, on this series is in-camera effects and so far as the laboratory is concerned. I mean, we won't be able to get away with that when we you know, are recreating New York. I mean, it's just impossible to recreate New York of that era unless you're using sure. visual effects, uh, computer-generated effects. But we can certainly publicize the idea that the laboratories are all in camera, and that I think is a very exciting uh, prospect. Uh, as far as yeah, I mean, having a uh, scaled-up cosmic induction generator sitting on uh, the bench doing the real thing <laughs> is uh, exactly. going to be something you know the the public has never seen. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Eric I've never can seen definitely that. do the real thing. I mean, this is the point. Is that I've never seen these devices in, in operation, but I know they exist. My heart knows they exist. I know there's enough. Mm-hmm. I just know, right? Like after I read Jean Manning's book, so much of the stuff that she explained is just so sensibly explained that it just overcame any kind of objection. Now, certainly, I'm an early adopter when it, you know, in that tech vernacular. Um, as far as ideas is concerned, because I have very open mind. It doesn't mean I'm gullible doesn't mean that I'm uh, willing to accept anything on face value, but I do want to see these things work. And this is a way to do that. So, Right. Now, you were you know, mentioning that you were uh, in Nelson for a while. I was actually up there, I don't know, about a month and a half ago, because that's only a few hours uh, from Spokane. But uh, if you're ever in the area um, here and there's a place in Nevada, I could definitely uh, arrange some uh, interesting uh, demonstrations. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is it. I mean, <laughs> when you were you were you were, you were talking about uh, you know what these people can contribute to the series. I mean, we want you to back the campaign because we need to back. We need backers. If we don't have backers, right. the whole thing goes poof and it's gone again, right? Uh, which would be not only painful for me personally and probably uh, dangerous for me professionally because at that point I'm running out of money. But uh, uh-huh. but it would also just be a great travesty. Now, beyond the money, there's just unlimited room for these technical advisors and historical uh, consultants. Mm-hmm. I mean, when we sit down and we say, this is our writer, we feed them with the people and information that they need to construct the story. 
we give them a basic outline right. of what we want the story to be from A to B mm -hmm. season one. Some of the fantastical aspects as well we have to put in because they're interesting. People love to talk about time travel, instantaneous transportation, all that kind of stuff. That's where the sci-fi comes in. Mm -hmm. But when we're dealing with the historical truths or facts or, or even um, the, uh, the word, you know, the people's um, stories passed down from generation, I mean, they may get distorted, but they're still closer to the facts than we even have on, on uh, any kind of uh, data record unless they're written by Tesla himself. The rest is all just speculation. So it would be really good to, to have all those people involved, and many of you listening may be those people. Um, and, and we're not, you know, heavy-duty Hollywood people. We don't, well, I mean, Fred is. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm, I'm coming at it from a different perspective. I'm saying let's bring all these people in. Let's have them contributing. Let's do it in a very uh, methodical fashion so that when we're coming to write this series, we actually get all this information down on paper. And yeah, it may come up against a bit of objection from the networks, from you know maybe somebody on high in Mexico. But if we have a market because of the games and because of the, uh, the graphic novel that we want to do, we really can't say no. Mm -hmm. right. There's just too much of a yeah. demand. Right. And um, when you create the demand and people see money signs, they can see that they can make money out, uh, over it out of it, well, then you kind of overcome a lot of the objections that are in place. So. Well, the only thing I can imagine is anybody who would be listening to this right now um, absolutely would love to see a Tesla TV series and these um, games based on uh, Tesla, you know, uh, become Well, they'd be Tesla technology-centric. The games would certainly be Tesla right. technology-centric, and they would probably be a, a sort of an extrapolation of a lot of the conspiracy theories. Uh, that are out there. Um, not that we want to over pump that, but it becomes a compelling game environment that young people would want to engage in. Uh, but once right. you get them engaged, you can mm -hmm. express ideas and concepts and sort of bring all those things into the overall environment so that they get exposed to these things. I mean, you have to play the game, right? A little bit. And I don't mean the, the PC game or mobile game. I mean, I mean the world life game. You got to play it a little bit. You can't just be polarized on one end because then you just become ineffectual. That's my opinion, but that's how I see it. Right. You have to be able to sort of get in there and get your points across while at the same time making it uh, mass marketable. Otherwise, right. they don't get out there at all. And then what? Well, what do you get? Right. Right. Well, to anybody so, list, listening to this right now, um, you know, whatever you can do to help support the campaign, you know, please donate what you can. Um, I, I believe there's, um, for example, people can donate as little as five dollars and all the way up as much as they want. Um, can you explain a little bit about um, what kind of perks people get for for being able to contribute different amounts? Sure, I'd love to explain that. Um, and, and I just want to mention that um, I'm, I'm going to donate $100 myself because I just think it would be absolutely awesome to have uh, copies of the, uh, uh, the TV series uh, script. That, that's, yeah. You know, yeah, that I is think one it's pretty historical. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's, it's, a a it's interactive. I'll explain that in a second here. So yeah, $5, you, you basically are saying you, you, you love us, you wanted to be united front for test. So this is for people who don't have a lot of cash. Uh, but they want to you know, support the campaign one way or another. And when you do that, when you give any amount, you have the opportunity to share this information or share the fact that you donated with everybody you know on Facebook, email, Twitter, whatever. So it just starts the fire up, right? That's what we need. We need mass amounts of people at that level. I mean, a lot of people are embarrassed. I've even had friends tell me I'm embarrassed to give five bucks. I had to like pull teeth to get them to give me five bucks. Even though they were, you know, they can afford it, but they're worried about how they look, given $5. And I'm here to say, listen, don't worry about it. You know, if we can get 10,000 people to give $5, those 10,000 shares that they make on Facebook and, and on Twitter and everywhere else after they've made that donation is so valuable. It's so valuable to this campaign because then it goes out to, you know, 1,000 other people each and out of that, you might get a handful of people who donate 100 bucks, and you've done, you've duplicated your effort a thousand times. So that's what that's about. That five dollar amount. So please don't be shy. 
Nobody's judging you for five dollars. I'm not judging you. I'm I'm saying that's one of the most valuable levels uh, for mm-hmm. that reason. The ten dollar pledge is um, you know you, ex- you explore the world in Nikola Tesla. We created a, a picture which you see on this this um, as the, the opening picture of this video. You can see New York there, Tesla sitting there, the Warden Cliff Tower with sparks coming off of it. Well, that's a massive photograph. We created a a hundred and 87 megabyte photographs that you you will get uh, in a digital format. So you can go and explore this world that we created uh, of all these iconic buildings and places that were uh, central to the time. I'm personally interested in architecture. That's why I did it. <laughs> okay. And I really love the architecture of uh, Lower Manhattan at that time. And I also put in uh, photo negatives of a lot of the articles that Tesla wrote or were written about him, so you can see them out in space. You can see some of his uh, patents floating around in space as though they're constellations. Essentially, that's the poster we created for the series, or you know, maybe perfected beyond this. But you'll get that. You'll get that as your screensaver. So we'll just, we'll send you that for ten dollars. It's just something that we can give that doesn't take away from our ability to do the campaign, but gives you something. Mm-hmm. In terms um, with, uh, with that, you know, with that quote, uh, excuse me, uh, but with a photo that size and that resolution, would people be permitted to take it to a copy shop and like have a nice print printed that they could put in a frame and hang on their wall or something? Or? Actually, what we're giving is the 1080p version, so you get it as a screensaver. It's not big enough probably to print, but in some of the later ones, uh, we can do it. And you know what? We can look at it. If we're very successful, I mean, it doesn't cost us anything to send everybody the high-res version. We just send it to their email. And that's one of the reasons we chose digital products initially was that it doesn't cost, it doesn't take away from our ability to do what we're doing, uh, but it yeah. gives you something really substantial in return. So, you know, we've got it at the $10 mark. You get the 1080p version. And I hope... This will make a nice 8x10. Yeah, it's an 8x10. Of course they can print it out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, it would. I mean, I'd love to see it on everybody's wall. <laughs> I mean, the artwork is all part of the fun, right? Um, right. And so at the $15 mark, because a lot of people do like merchandise, uh, we added a Tesla keychain, which is uh, basically a keychain that uh, you know you can use to put keys on for your house. And it just reminds you that you backed us at that uh, $15 mark, and you got something for it and at 20 We've got the Insiders Club. This is sort of where we sort of invite people into the idea that you have an exclusive membership where we start feeding you insider information that we won't release anywhere else. And that is really the behind-the-scenes look at what's going on and in terms of our development of the series, information on how that's going, even news reports on what our meetings went, how they went, um, you know, with different networks. And, and it really gives you guys an opportunity to make a, a fuss if you feel like, and sometimes it is a little bit stupid what goes on in this industry. So it's an easy way for us to remind you that there's a bit of stupidity and ignorance going on here, and you make a big fuss, and a lot of times that'll change the network's mind. Mm-hmm. So you get that information at 20 bucks. You basically get all that information. You get the keychain, and you get the, uh, the picture, and you get your name listed. I mean, each reward tier comes with all the previous reward tiers. Okay. So if, you, so if you buy 20, or if you get in at 20, you get the 15, you get the 10, you get the 5, and you get the $20 reward. So you get it all together. Uh, at 30, we've got a uh, Tesla coffee mug. So that's pretty cool. Um, mm-hmm. Tesla Man of Light coffee mug. That's something you want to get. A lot of people like that stuff. We just want people to back up. <laughs> so we're trying to get them something that they like, right? Um, at 35, they get the Tesla tote bag. Um, so again, you become a walking promotion for something you truly believe in, and it's not just merchandising for merchandising's sake for some media conglomerate to make money. It's actually, to, again, burst this bubble on why people don't know about Tesla and the ideas. It gives a, it gives a talking point for people to talk around. Say, oh, what's that tote bag? Oh, it's a Tesla tote bag. I backed this TV series. What's a TV series? Well, you don't know about Tesla? You become an educational tool in, in, in the world. Uh, at forty dollars, we get the development dossier. Now, this is where you re- receive again an exclusive access to a development dossier. So, what's in that? You get the story trees, which I think will be very interesting for people to see. And that's the actual point by point story trees of what each major character. And we have a possibility of up to one hundred major characters. Literally, I mean, when you think about it, you've got Rockefeller, you've got his wife, you've got 
J.P. Morgan, all those guys. You get uh, the Rothschilds. You get those guys. You get all the titled nobility hanging around at that time. You get the best uh, names from that time filtering through New York, whether it's uh, anybody from um, you know Amelia Earhart to uh, you name it. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright was a contemporary. I mean, when you've got New York as a major character in itself, you can bring all these people in. And so all their story trees would be available, uh, development images that we create, uh, complete video interviews with the team. Uh, these will be ongoing that we produce. So you'll get a private username and you'll log in and you'll be able to access story notes, development artwork, and all sorts of uh, bonus materials. And of course, you get the Insider Club and the Tesla Fan and all the previous awards. Um, now the portraits, at the $60, we've created some portraits which are character portraits of, of um, the main characters that we see being not only in the TV series but in the uh, PC game, the mobile game. And you get to pick three of the digital portraits. Uh, again, you can print these. Um, they're full HD resolution portraits. They're about uh, three feet by two feet each. So they can be printed and put on your wall or your office or wherever. And you have exclusive rights to do that. You also get the development dossier, the Tesla fan, the insider fan rewards. And uh, if you want additional portraits, you can buy them for five bucks. We're going to have up to nine uh, to start. Obviously, as we get uh, the money from the Kickstarter, we'll have a lot more development images as uh, we come out. Um, at the $100 pledge where you're going to put yourself in there, uh, I think for me, anyway, this is one of the main interests. It's the pilot script and the storyboard. So this is the board you'll be um, uh, invited to essentially see the complete pilot script before anybody else even sees it, and including the storyboard, which is just a basic storyboard, but it'll show you the action. And um, you get um, also the Tesla portraits. You get the development dossier. You get the insider club and the Tesla fan uh, rewards. Now, part of this particular uh, backing pledge amount, $100, you get to, when we deliver this story to you, it's in a format, it's an app. So it's a free ed app that you download to your smartphone, whether it be um, Apple or, or Android or, or Windows-based. Mm -hmm. And that app, once you've read the story in its script format, you get an opportunity to give us feedback on the various different aspects of the story. So you can literally vote as to where you see we want to see this story go. So you really get to put your stamp on it right. in the development phase. And I think this is uh, important, particularly for people who have invested a lot of their time and energy in becoming open-minded enough to uh, say, hey, I know this stuff exists. I want to see it in the world for positive change because I'm sick and tired of oil and gas wars and all the rest of the crap and nuclear meltdowns all over the place. Um, you're getting to invest your time in a rewarding fashion that actually helps us define the story so you can help hide where you want, hide where you want mm -hmm. to go. And it also tells the audience or sort of the uh, network, hey, we've got a, an invested uh, audience. Not only have they agreed that this is the story, they've actually contributed to it. So there's really no arguing that this is the story that has to be made. A way of protecting the story. Um, between us, that's that's what it's that's about. And of course you can add on whatever, but that's up to you. So at the hundred dollar mark, that's what you get. If you're backing us, now people call these donations. They're not donations. You get stuff for this. So every time you're backing us, you're backing us. Don't consider it a donation. We're here to reward you for these things. So I just want to keep saying that because a lot of people call it donation. It's not a donation. You're backing us and you're getting something for it. Uh, at the hundred and sixty dollar pledge amount you get the limited edition digital. That's the 187 megabyte, or sorry, 174 megabyte high resolution image of that poster. Now, I personally am, I tried to organize it before, but I couldn't organize it before. There's just too much to do, but I wanted to get it printed out so I could have a picture of myself beside it as part of this campaign because it's one of my favorite things are these high resolution posters. When you get them done, especially in the cardboard format or in those uh, hardboards, I put them up on my wall everywhere. I've got pictures of New York already on my wall. But I can't wait to do this one because not only are you going to be able to see those those buildings and everything, you're going to be able to read what's in those articles that are floating in space. Um, so it's pretty cool. It's like it's an, it's an amazing piece as well. So, well so you yeah, those are huge. Uh, what's that? Uh, those are huge. Yeah, those are physical huge. size. I mean, it's yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it says 5 feet by 3 feet here in size at 174 megabytes, but in reality, by the time we actually start delivering this product, I'm actually interested in seeing it 8 feet by 5 feet. So at $160, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm going for. I, I just, I didn't want to say 8 by 5 until I could deliver it, so I had to say mm -hmm. 5 by 3 right here. But in reality, that's where I'd like to see it, because I want people to really live in their minds in this world because it's such a great place, <laughs> you know. Right. New York at that time was not only the most important place, it was one of the most innovative, uh, exciting places, and Tess was all over it. It's just all over it. I mean, he, one of the things a lot of people probably do understand in your market, but don't understand out there in the world, is that Tessa was one of the most famous people of his time. Right. Yeah, and scientists used to be celebrities, but not so right. much anymore. Right. Right. Well, he was super famous. I mean, people traveled the world to meet him, and they went to New York. And this is what I mean. Like, he's, he's even tied up with uh, Hitler in, in various ways. There's a friend of his that, that actually traveled or was a writer for the World magazine, which was uh, published by one of his other friends, that um, was sort of picked up or caught the attention of Freud. And Freud said, hey, why don't you come and interview us, because I can see you're into this whole nihilistic stuff. And and all that stuff. And so he wanted to be interviewed by this particular um, uh, writer. And so this writer went to Europe and he interviewed Freud. And the next guy he interviewed was Hitler in 1923. And then he went and interviewed Mussolini. And then he interviewed and blah, blah, blah. And then he went back to, uh, to Tesla and told him about all this stuff. So there's direct connections to every major world changer that, that put their stamp on the 20th century J. Edgar Hoover, you know, everybody has some sort of connection to Tesla, and we're going to explore that in this TV series. Anyway, back to these uh, rewards. So at the $160 reward, you get that major large size um, uh, poster. You can also get the big posters of the portraits, because they're all big 5x3 as well. So you can print all this stuff if you like. I mean, obviously you don't have to, but if you want to, you're totally welcome to do it. You have an exclusive right to do it, which you normally wouldn't get because most people, most networks and most IP developers want to protect every single thing and squeeze every drop out of you. But I'm saying, listen, we'll give it to you in a digital format for backing us. It cuts down the costs for us because we don't have to print it for you and send it to you, so that money goes into the development of the story. And then you get the right to print it if you want. Right. And of course, you get the pilot script and the storyboard as well, because every time you buy a pledge higher, you get the ones before, especially mm -hmm. in the digital format. So that pledge at 160 gives you the uh, limited edition digital. It gives you the, of the poster. It gives you the pilot script and storyboard, so you can continue to interact with Tesla, the Tesla portraits, the development dossier. We get you all the insider information, all delivered by an app. You get the Insiders Club and the Tesla fan rewards. So it just keeps going up, right? Right. 400, you get uh, an actual print. If you want us to print it for you, we'll do it. So at $400, we actually give you the print poster, and it's um, a print portrait as well. So you'll get limited edition digital reward in the print as well, so you can do other copies. You get the Tesla portrait, which I don't know if uh, anybody's on the web page right now, but if you're actually uh, on the web page right now and you're going through these rewards with me right now, which would be a really smart thing to do, is go to Tesla Man of Light on uh, Kickstarter, and as I'm describing these rewards, you can see them in the right column. But if you go up a little bit, you'll see an original um, portrait done of Nikola Tesla, done by a friend of mine. I mean, he's just a genius concept artist, gorgeous piece. It's also five foot by three, and we'll print it out for you. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful and, image. And, um, it is. I love it. It's, I just love the trees that are sort of in his face, and the tree in the background with the electricity kind of running through him. Uh, I don't know. He just, he's an unusual artist. He's very talented, and he's a bit of a savant as well. He's hard to actually nail down and get him to do the work because he's, he's just so wrapped up in fanciful ideas. But he managed to do this, and it, he managed to do all the other portraits that are listed on here that you'll see, for, um, which is just gorgeous work, right? Just gorgeous stuff. And so those are the portraits that you're dealing with when you're talking about uh, this $400. Reward. You get the print of the poster, which is the Tesla Man Light television series poster, and you get a print of the uh, Tesla portrait, and um, it's all there for you. So it's pretty cool. And then you get, of course, all the digital rewards that come before. So you get the um, 
Tesla Fortress, the Development Dossier, the Insider's Club, the Fan Club, and the Tesla Fortress. At 800, we give you a vinyl one. This is, uh, again, I want to do an 8 feet by 5 feet. I got it listed here as 5 by 3. But until I can deliver that 8 by 5, I'm just not able to say that that's what we're rewarding. Mm-hmm. But you'll get a vinyl a poster. Um, so we're including the limited edition digital poster as well. So you get that. You get the pilot script and the storyboard, the test of portraits, the development dossier, the insiders club, and the fan club, and you get this vinyl print of the um, of the um, series poster. So I love that reward. Nobody's bought one yet, but hopefully we'll get some people out there. We got somebody who got in here at 1600 it's original artwork. This is very cool. This goes back to uh, Jan Sobek, who we didn't really talk about, but uh, he's a um, very accomplished illustrator. He's also just happens to be the director of new exhibits at the Czech National Museum, which is one of the most important um, archives of historical uh, artifacts and data in Europe. Uh, anybody okay. who's ever been to Prague will note Prague itself is really just a big, giant, human-occupied museum. So the museum there is, is very important. It has uh, 12, I think, main structures. It's got three major castles. He's got 14 million items. He's the director of new exhibits at that museum. Uh, he's a personal friend of mine. He lives here in Calgary, ironically, despite all of his historical significance and the stuff that he's done. He's also the original illustrator of Jurassic Park. Uh, he's good friend oh, wow. the uh, writer of, of um, uh, Vampire Diaries and people like that. I'm sure a lot of your audience doesn't give a care for that, but if they do, he, he did have a, a, a major uh, influence on that becoming successful. And he's and really he's highlighted the director. Director. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Uh, now, and he, uh, there's a segment on him in the video at the top of the campaign pages. And it, um, yeah, think. he's in the video as well. All the major uh, players are in the video. So you'll hear mm-hmm. directly from Fred talking about why he wants to do this series and how he sees it and where he sees it landing. Uh, in terms of the networks and why we're doing it. Same with uh, Jan. We're in his um, in his uh, 18th century, or sorry, 19th century menagerie, which is kind of like a, a typical library that most people of that era would have. Well, he just happens to have one in the basement of his house uh, where he has a, uh, a real um, skull of a um, saber-toothed tiger, for instance. He's got, you know, all kinds of battle axes from the day that he's personally collected. He's got a shank from, uh, um, uh, where is that, uh, Alcatraz. It was originally made. I mean, he's just he's a fascinating, humble man, and he just does amazing work. And so he's our art director all the way through, whether it's the uh, television series, the um, mm-hmm. graphic novels, of which he historically has done over 300 uh, books that he's illustrated over the years. And he's a big part of this. So the original artwork at $1,600 is actually original artwork by him or his team done for Tesla Man of Light that actually has a signature and a personal message on it sent to you. So it's the original piece. It's not a copy. It's the original piece. And it's hanging on your wall. And um, it's, it's his artwork. And or anybody on the team. So his name and because he directed it and whoever the artist is will we'll sign it and uh, we'll send it to you. And of course, you get the limited edition digital, you get the pilot script, storyboard, the Tesla portraits, development dossier, insiders club, and, and more. And now this $8,000, we've sold two, and I think one other person is going to buy one real shortly here. And we're hoping we sell more of these for people who are kind of at that if we can get the word out, get you know those executives out there who fancy getting into the film industry or just being a part of it somehow, have a lot of disposable cash, want to have some fun. 8,000 is actually uh, attendance at the Banff World Media Festival with Fred, with Jan, with Mike Sorrenti, our games developer, and myself, and anybody else at that point in time who are connected to this series. And we'll have our private dinner there. And we'll have uh, executives from different uh, you know, film and TV companies who will give closed section, uh, sessions on lectures. This is just all part of the BAMP package in general anyway. And so it's quite an experience. So anybody who wants to really see how things are done from the inside of the industry uh, can go. Now, the BAMP World Media Festival is held at the BAMP Springs Hotel. 
I don't know a lot of people in the States who will know of that Banff Hotel, but it's literally a massive castle. It's the original choice of location for Kubrick's um, uh, The Shining, but he couldn't get a hold of the whole hotel for the amount of months and time that he wanted because it was just too expensive. So he didn't get to shoot there, which is a pity because it's just a fantastic place. It was built... Um, Right around the time of Tesla in New York, it was built in 1900. Actually, it was originally built by in wood in in the late 19th century. It burnt down, and this is where the whole ghost thing comes in. And because uh, that hotel has that sort of reputation of having ghosts, they promote it, of course, right? And um, and then uh, they rebuilt it as a as a stone castle after that. And there's portions of the building that are actually from the original wood structure, but most of it's now this stone structure that was built, I think, in 1907 or 1908. A lot of people went there. I, um, there's a great story uh, that we want to put into the television series. It's kind of a subplot where uh, the white heavyweight champion of the world, who was this real guy in 1911, um, was going to fight somebody in New York and the guy got injured. So they went looking for somebody to fight them. And I don't know if anybody's ever heard of the Calgary Stampede, but the Stampede was just getting going. We had our 100th year centennial. Uh, I'm not particularly fond of the Stampede, but at that time it was a big deal. And it um, was happening, and guess who should show up but the white heavyweight champion of the world, along with uh, Carnegie and uh, Vanderbilt on a little road trip on one of their train lines. And they show up at this thing, and the white heavyweight champion fights this guy. Okay, I've seen a photograph of this guy in the ring with this farmer, this Ukrainian farmer from uh, from out in this area. Has never been in a bare knuckle fight match before that we know of. Anyway, minute and thirty six seconds into it, he kills this guy from New York, right in the ring. Mm-hmm. White heavyweight champion dead. The place goes wild. They burn the barn down. And the guy's cremated in the barn on the ring. <laughs> wow! It's just a it's a true story. Mm-hmm. It, it's a true story. That's this is a funny thing. I mean, these are wild true stories. I mean, this might be like half of an episode kind of thing that we get into it, but it just shows kind of the intensity and the wildness of that time out west. So a little subplot that I'd like to put in there. Anyway, so this reward eight thousand gives you access to that event. Another thing I want to say about rewards is that there's a whole new set of rewards that kick in the minute we break 90,000. The minute we break 90,000, we're going after a stretch goal, which is the, uh, the, the story bible. If we break 200,000, we go after the mobile game. It brings a whole new set of rewards into here. So each mm-hmm. package will just have things added to it. Uh, so if you buy now and you help us get to those stretch goals, then obviously you're... You're just you're getting more rewards as we each as we get as we break these stretch goals. By the time we're done, if we get to our top end stretch goal, which I have no idea, total mystery to me if we will or not. Uh, but if we do, then the reward the rewards attached to each one of these levels just becomes more and more and more. Well, it's certainly going to take you know everybody working together. You know, not just people involved with the campaign, but anybody who's interested, you know, definitely donate what you can from $5, you know, all the way up as much as you can uh, um, uh, care to um, contribute to it, uh, you know, as a backer, and you are, you know, receiving some pretty uh, um, awesome uh, uh, items for this, you know, everything from keychains to coffee mugs to these high-quality prints. Um, yeah, that's quite a bit more than just posters. I mean, these are pieces of art, unique pieces mm-hmm. of art relating to Tesla that, you know, make an awesome piece in a room. I mean... Yeah. Well, anybody can help, right? I mean, the 99%, if you want, um, you know, I don't want to hijack a movement or anything, but let's just say the 99% who feel disenfranchised can put a lot of money in. They're going to have a positive impact on this, even if they're able to get 5 10 $20 because of the amount of sharing they can do and the amount of activity and the time right. that they can invest. But I think everybody's got to put something in because if you're interested in Tesla at all, I don't know anybody in the world other than in third world countries where people are really poor, can't put $5 in. Anybody in North America, unless you're living on the street, can put $5 in. And with that $5, you're, you're really showing that you're going to do something. And on top of that, it, makes you, it gives you more of an impetus to actually get involved and share and spend your time and do all of that. 
I don't want to disrespect people who don't feel like they have the money, but I'm just saying to you, like, you can do a lot with five dollars. You can do a lot with ten dollars. Whatever you can give. And then those high end things, yeah. I mean, those are for people that have a lot of disposable cash, and they should put that money in because it helps the whole thing. That's what they can do. Everybody can play their part. Right. Well, I mean, you know, this campaign just launched, and it's already over eighteen thousand dollars. You know, which is a good sign showing that you know people definitely want this to happen. And um, so if you're listening to this, you know, whatever you can donate, um, you know, put in, you know, five bucks if you can, if you can do more, uh, you know, e- even better. Um, you just go to kickstarter.com and type in Tesla Man of Light. And in this campaign, um, you know, and if for some reason you're unable to even come up with five dollars, right under the video, watch that video and underneath, um, share this page and tweet it. There's the, the Facebook um sharing button and the tweet button and at least get the word out because I mean that doesn't cost you anything and you know everybody should at least be doing that send it out to your you know let, let your friends know about it um, it helps too because uh, there's a Kickstarter algorithm I mean I can't confirm this but most sites will operate on this level I mean Google does it every search engine does so it's my feeling that there is a, a um, and it's been talked about a lot in, in different you know um, chat groups and stuff. There's a Kickstarter algorithm that kicks in and gets noticed by Kickstarter and they start putting this project front and center. And they have seven million people that have already backed campaigns in their catalog of people they have direct contact with. They can put mm-hmm. us out to all those people if we trigger that algorithm and that requires shares and likes and, and those five dollar, right. ten dollar mass donations. We need mass numbers of people donating and sharing to trigger that. Sure, yeah, they're going to highlight what people are obviously showing they're the most interested in. Great. I mean, so on, um, now bes- now besides this Kickstarter page, um, there's a website, teslamanoflight.com. Yeah, that, the website, have, uh, yeah. well, it has some other content on it. It's mostly a duplication of what's here on the Kickstarter site because we didn't have a lot of time to add to it. But there is a nice gallery there of glass plate images that I spent a lot of time collecting which sort of helped me get into the world itself that Tesla inhabited. And it Mm -hmm. turned on a lot of lights for me in terms of the environment that he was in and the kind of impact that his work had because even at the time, and we're talking about the transition from kerosene and and lamps and and, uh, candle lit uh, environments that had been the predominant uh, reality for, you know, literally let's say, several thousand years, suddenly Mm -hmm. to illuminated, right? And so they actually had theme parks. You know, you've heard of Coney Island. Well, the significance of Coney Island was, it was huge. There was a a place called Luna Park on um, Coney Island that was invented to dazzle people with the new phenomena of electricity. Mm -hmm. So there's some great images of that that were glass plate images, which are stunning images of these glass plate imagery back in those days. I wish we were still doing it (laughs) because it's just amazing the type of composition and the thought that went into these photographs and then, of course, the quality and the definition of these these images are just incredible. I mean, you can blow up all these photographs to 8 by 5 feet if you wanted. That might be something we do later uh, as a a way to merchandise in order to fuel the the creation of the series and and keep it profitable so that there's really no objection from the marketplace uh, as far as inviting it into the marketplace for mass exposure. But some of those images are there and it really gives you some insight into the the people and the time and the aesthetic of that time. Because on one side, it's a period drama, right? And we have to recreate an era in New York with all that architecture, with all that beautiful aesthetic and the fascination, the, the sort of environment, the, the, the collected conscience waking up to this idea that electricity is now possible and we can do things with electricity, and then that whole thing being hijacked by fossil fuels. It's a really fascinating time period, and I really think that's, that's integral and central to the storyline. So, it's all there, right, in photographs, right on the, on the website. It's beautiful stuff. We've got our video there, too. You can look at it. And of course, it leads a leads people to the campaign page. It's got a button that says uh, can't back this project and it'll click you right to the, the Kickstarter page. So you can go there too and you won't get lost. You can head right back to our, our campaign page. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I, I just want to 
restate that you know this this whole campaign, um, little by little, and you know looking at it holistically, um, you know a lot of you listening to this right now are probably uh, you know fans of uh, Eric Dollard's work, uh, Paul Babcock, and uh, Jim Murray, and uh, you know other people who whose work you know we've been publishing for a while either through the conferences um, or the contributing into the forums and that kind of thing is that um, you know this is an opportunity for um, you know people such as Eric Dollard's work getting out to the mainstream eventually you know what raising the awareness of that so it's not just in this you know um, bubble you know network of so-called free energy enthusiasts or you know whatever you want to call it but um, you know, because a lot of this work is so important, but um, it needs to really kind of get out there. And, and this this whole campaign, this TV series, the games, or uh, or an opportunity to help make that happen. Yeah, and you know, this work is. We don't know how impactful it is yet until it comes out in the mainstream. We don't know what impact mm -hmm. it's going to have on society. It is dangerous in a lot of ways, it's like opening a Pandora's box. And but you know. It's got to happen eventually. Otherwise, we're going to ruin ourselves with this nuclear stuff and with the fossil fuel wars and all this crap that's going right. on that just has to end. And this is one of the ways to end that. No matter what comes next, we don't know. It's going to force us to take a lot more responsibility for who we are when we have suddenly access to free energy. You know, It's going to change the political landscape because we're not going to be under the influence of a single group of people as much as we were. But that also puts the emphasis on us as responsible adults to manage ourselves in the scope of free energy. It's going to change everything. I can't fantasize what it's going to be exactly, but that's what we're talking about. Right. We're talking about pushing it in mainstream. We're talking about doing it now. You know, I mean, I, I told you before the reason my company is called Maya Media is I spent 20 years investing my time in studying the calendar and studying my cosmology and not only from the sort of new age perspective, but academics and all the different cutting edge fields. And I can tell you that that turning point in 2012 is about this kind of thing. It's not just about this, but it's about this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's the end of the old world. It's the beginning of the new. We're at that turning point. That's what this is about. Well, we They're can definitely not. see it in the world around us. I mean, the, the light is getting lighter and the dark is getting darker. And there's this big polarization. And, uh, you know, we need to um, definitely do whatever we can. People in Ukraine are willing to die to not be part of a system that doesn't work in Russia. Mm -hmm. What are we willing to do? Are we willing to dislodge a little few dollars? I mean, I don't want to little people, but it's just we have to be willing Right. And I know that your audience is because they're actively doing it, but it's time right. to break out of that bubble, as I say, and I'm not saying that in any kind of derogatory way. I'm just saying I've never been exposed to this stuff physically in mm -hmm. front of me. I want that. Right. Mm -hmm. This is how I've figured out a way to marry my passions with that desire. Sure. Well, there's definitely a lot of synergy here with, with you know, what, what your vision is and what, where this campaign is going and, uh, you know, a lot of people that I'm connected with and, you know, a lot of people who have been following, uh, you know, a lot of this work. And so, um, you know, I'm happy to it's be a, a part of, a of it. Right, yeah. And this is one of those opportunities. It's a very public forum. It makes a statement. Right. I mean, they already did it a little bit with the, the Tesla Museum. That was a huge step forward. They mm -hmm. even had... Uh, Elon Musk jump in, even though I know Elon is really possibly, I don't want to belittle the man, I don't know the man, but from a business point of view, it's great marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hoping we can make a big enough splash that he sees the marketing potential for his, his, uh, you know, his car company. Love it or hate it, it can help us. Because the right. end goal is the end goal. How we get there, even if we have to compromise just a little to get there, even if we have to I'm not saying we're compromising at all by being involved with him. I would love to meet him. I would love to talk to him. I think he's really keen, actually, on figuring out how to use ether fuel the way you were describing it to me earlier because he's out there in space with his SpaceX. Well, mm -hmm. you know, there you go, direct connection to this, this uh, fuel source. 
I'm sure he's interested. Well, he's already rocking the boat enough with what he's got going on. That's my point. <laughs> so we got we we got to help yeah. him help us. You know what I mean? Like they, everybody's trying. I believe everybody's trying. Who is trying? And we just got to let everybody do our parts and not get on each other's back about it. Just do what we can. Right. Because there's a lot of people will help us if we open the door for them. Sure. Well, we're definitely yep. going to get the word out, and uh, I'm going to be putting this on YouTube, making that available, and we'll post it on our blog, and I'll, I'll definitely uh, make a post in our forums, and uh, next time we send out a newsletter, um, we're definitely going to direct people to this uh, interview so people can learn about it, and, and we'll give links to the uh, Kickstarter campaign. So Tesla Man of Light, um, uh, again, go to kickstarter.com, search for Tesla Man of Light, go in there, and um, help back the campaign with whatever you can. And, uh, and make sure to hit that share button on uh, Facebook and uh, tweet it out to your friends and let people know about it. It's going to be the only way to make it happen. So, Great. Stacey, um, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, chat with me and educating myself and uh, uh, everybody else about what your campaign is about. And uh, perhaps here uh, you know, in, a, in a few weeks, maybe we can do it again and kind of, kind of get an update on uh, how it's going. Hey, if anybody's going to be in New York on October 4th for the uh, debut of this uh, Tower to the People, that's a documentary produced by the people who bought the museum or bought the, the um, uh, Wardenclyffe site, I'm going to be there. So if anybody's going to be there, let's meet, let's talk. You can meet me face to face. We can have a conversation. It would be great. And I want to thank you, Aaron. Um, you know, when we launched it, i got to say I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. I mean, nobody likes to fail, especially big. <laughs> And that's my biggest fear is that we're going to fail big. But, um, you know, when you came on and started to uh, show your support and your interest and um, you know, asked me to do this, I just can't thank you enough for doing that. Hey, my pleasure. Well, thank you. This was, yeah, uh, thanks, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Really do. Okay. We'll be in touch, and uh, we'll, we'll be talking soon. Okay? Yeah. Thanks. We'll talk to you soon, guys. Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Take care. Ciao. Ciao. Hey. Bye, everybody into the market, and we do a graphic novel and, and a series of games. And it's all geared to um, expose the story of Nikola Tesla, which from my point of view is an under-investigated story, even from a literary point of view. Uh, from what I've read, I've got a couple of books that I've read, which of course doesn't tap the whole amount of stuff that's out there. I've read uh, the book Tesla. Inventor of the Electrical Age by W. Bernard Coulson. Uh, of course, read um, Tesla, Nikola Tesla, My Inventions and Other Writings uh, through Penguin Classics. And then I've gone on to uh, teslacollection.com and read a lot of the articles that were written by Tesla or about Tesla during his lifetime and some of the things that he was saying and doing at that time. So that's the, the um, <clears throat> limit of my understanding of Tesla. Uh, from the literary point of view and what's available in the archives. Uh, mm -hmm. I've also um, <clears throat> been looking at and have read, actually the thing that got me really into this whole topic was uh, Gene Manning's book, uh, The Coming Energy Revolution, uh, which I picked up in Vancouver at uh, Banyan Books when I was, uh, well, I guess about 12, 13 years ago. <clears throat> yeah, I guess it was 14 years ago now. Something along those lines. So, I uh, came across that book, um, and it really opened my mind. I mean, I was already an open-minded person, having lived, in, lived all that time in Nelson, exposed to people who said they had free energy devices, but I didn't really know anything about it, and I didn't see one in operation in front of me, so I can't claim that. Uh, however, um, it just was a, a time in my life when I was doing a lot of meditation, had a lot of success with that in respect to... Um, putting an end to compulsive thinking patterns. And when you do that, your mind just becomes an open vastness of space, uh, a peaceful, loving space. And from that point of view, you became aware of and open to all kinds of ideas, including unlimited abundance of the universe. And the obvious translation of that would be free energy, or as I like to think of it, open-ended fuel sources. And... Uh, wanting to pursue a film and television career as a writer and producer so I could get a lot of these ideas out there, um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing, and really make something work. So I filmed the entire experience 
with the intention of putting it together as a uh, uh, reality show. So during the day of filming and planting and during the night downloading things and then um, putting it in the archive. When I headed home, I got it edited together as a trailer. I submitted it as part of a submission to uh, Bell Media, which is one of the, the major media conglomerates here in Canada, and they awarded me a fellowship, which um, took me to the Banff World Media Festival in 2012. Part of that fellowship, they give you access to all the individuals, particularly development executives who are there to develop content for television, and one of the names that jumped right out, obviously, was Fred Fuchs. Now, I didn't actually know him or of him before seeing his name listed there, but I saw that he was uh, head of creative content at the Canadian National Broadcast Channel for quite a few years, and during his time there commissioned the Tudors, Borgias, Vikings, a few other very phenomenal uh, television series that uh, I was in love with, and I thought, wow, here's a great chance. And so I did a little more investigation, obviously found out he was at Zoetrope. I just couldn't believe my lucky stars. He took a meeting with me. It was my mm -hmm. first meeting of a three-day experience in Banff, and um, he said that well, when, I, when I communicated with him by email, I sent him about six different proposals in about a paragraph format. One of them was this idea of doing a television series about Nikola Tesla. So when I sat down with him for my 15, 20-minute meeting, which happens, you basically get 20 of those all for the three days, and uh, he said, well, I took this meeting because of this Tesla project you want to do. And he told me the history of how he had wanted to do it uh, with Coppola. It didn't get off the ground for various reasons. He wouldn't extrapolate why it didn't get off the ground, but he didn't indicate a conspiracy. He just indicated that scheduling problems and other sort of issues prevented it from getting financed and off the ground, uh, but that Daniel Day-Lewis was going to star and that Coppola was going to direct and for whatever reason didn't get, didn't get off the ground. So he was excited to do this. A year later, eventually established my company around a certain number of intellectual properties, and one of the first things I wanted to do was the story of Tesla. Ended up. Now, um, we don't, mm -hmm. go ahead, yeah. Um, you, you have some pretty big names of uh, some people who are some serious mover and shakers in the film industry who you're working with. Uh, for example, uh, Fred Fuchs, who uh, produced Godfather Three and Bram Stoker's uh, Dracula. Um, yeah, how, how did you manage yeah. to um, hook up with him and, and get him involved in wanting to produce a Tesla TV series? Because that's, uh, that's some pretty serious uh, credibility there. Yeah, I'm obviously honored uh, to be working with him, not just because of his credentials, but because of who he is and what he's told me over the last couple of years that I've been working with him. Um, you know, here's a guy who was president of American Zotro for 12 years, uh, and that's Francis Ford Coppola's company. They were in San Francisco, and of course, uh, George Lucas helped found that company, and there's been a lot of great films that came out of there. And uh, more than just those two credits, he has 15 credits uh, to his name out of that film company, including New York Stories, which I find to be a landmark film, even though very few people know about it. It was a film that was co-directed by Scorsese, Woody Allen, and Coppola, and it was his brainchild. And during that time, he wanted to do a Tesla movie, a feature film directed by Coppola or someone like him. Uh, Lucas was involved as well, according to Fred, although to what degree, I don't know exactly. He didn't extrapolate on that. Um, Fred plays his cards very close to his chest, and that's probably why his friendships last a very long time. Okay. Mm. So how I came to him uh, was pretty simple. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd been struggling through the years to, you know, get myself off the ground in this chosen field. I ended up having to go back to tree planting, which is one of the most god-awful, wonderful experiences one can have. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows about it, but we actually physically plant three, four, five thousand trees a day sometimes by hand, wow. repopulating the forest. So I've done quite a few years of that. I did eight total years of that. In the last two years I did it, I was not young anymore, and it was quite a challenge, and it really gave me the impetus to get the hell out of that. Okay, uh, this is uh, Aaron Murakami, and today is Tuesday, September 30th, 2014, and uh, it's 
about uh, 11 o'clock here uh, Pacific. I'm up here in, out of uh, Spokane, Washington, and on the phone with me today, I have Stacy James Fry, who is heading up a Kickstarter campaign called Tesla Man of Light, and uh, there are several goals to this campaign. Um, Stacy, uh, would you mind just kind of, uh, you know, telling a little bit about yourself and uh, kind of what the overall bullet point mission of the uh, campaign is about? Sure, yeah. Uh, first, I'll just say hi, everybody. Nice to digital meet you. <laughs> uh, my name is Stacy James Fry. I'm the president and CEO of a um, startup, well, kind of an intellectual property company operating out of Calgary, Canada, which ironically just happens to be oil country. I was born and raised here, um, went to high school here, and then I left. Uh, went across Canada and then back ended up in Vancouver and then ended up in a small town called Nelson, B.C., which is kind of an alternative hippie town. A lot of uh, draft dodgers from the 60s ended up there. Uh, I landed there when I was 21, spent a good portion of my life there, about eight years. And uh, it was during my time there that I came across uh, things like what we're going to talk about. So this campaign that we're doing is designed to develop a major television drama for a major television network. Uh, I'll tell you how we plan on doing that. It's very realistic. And um, as part of that, also cultivate the market so that there's really no objection to, from a marketing standpoint or from a revenue standpoint uh, in within the business to put this television series on television and invest the dollars necessary to do that. So the starting point is this Kickstarter campaign. Um, it's called Tesla Man of Light. So if you go to kickstarter.com and you search Tesla Man of Light, you'll see it come up. First thing you see is it's a sci-fi TV series. Don't get upset by the sci-fi part. It's just part of how we Trojan horse this. Uh, I asked him to be a part of this Kickstarter campaign. He said, sure, let's do it and we recorded our portion of our video for that at the 2013 uh, event. And um, that's how he and I came to work together. Okay, awesome. Now, if uh, everybody goes to kickstarter.com and search for Tesla Man of Light, when you go to that campaign page, uh, towards the top there is an introductory video, what's maybe about 10 minutes or so, and that gives a really yep. good uh, overview of um, who's involved uh, behind the scenes and what their roles are. Um, so besides um, Fred Fuchs and, you, you know, on the uh, TV or, or the TV series production side of it, uh, there's also plans to create um, like a video game. Is this for like smart smartphone apps, Tesla games or like desktop games? And, and who's behind that? And... Uh, Sure. How, how does that yeah, come in? Yeah, there's two other individuals involved that are sort of the main core team. There's one, uh, Mike Sorrenti from a company in Toronto called GamePill.com, and they do a lot of um, contract work for Disney, Nickelodeon, Marvel, a few other uh, brands, quite a few other brands. And they develop mobile mm -hmm. games, mostly adventure games. And they do PC games, which are interactive uh, computer games. And so we mm -hmm. thought, well... Actually, Mike was one of the guys I met at that original um, Stamp World Media Festival uh, event as well in 2012, and we became friends. And so we stayed in contact. When I told him I was doing this, he got excited, said he'd love to do you know, the mobile and PC portion of the IP. And I initially thought, well, I don't know if we can pull that off. And he started talking to me about you know, how these interactive games work and how they would relate to Tesla technology. And he started to explain to me how we could do it from a story point of view. And it just really made a lot of sense because part of the whole objective of this project is to crack open or dislodge the inertia around these topics so that they can break through into the mainstream mind and really, at that point, be unpreventable from happening no matter how much oppression there is, especially now with the energy crisis and a real demand. 